This is your Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry. This is Roka. Should, should I have said John? No, that's Roka's all, good. That's, that's how people know me. All of a sudden. That's, you know, people know me by that. Okay, yeah. good enough. It's the weekend after Halloween, but we're, we're still keeping some of the horror alive thanks to Suspiria. <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows what this is. But Not yet. It'll be really creepy when you do see the movie, and it's probably going to fall over now. But that was my own fault. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing I've seen some of those in uh, uh, Hellraiser before, uh. Uh, hooking up into skin and dragging your skin off of you. So, no spoilers uh, here. No spoilers. Uh, you know, like we haven't seen that before on film. But certainly, uh, yeah, I've seen that. I, I chose to go with my Gladiator uh, uh, a helmet here that I got as uh, as a gift from uh, one of the fans of the Top Ten Show because we're circling into Oscar season. We're rounding that corner into Oscar season now that Halloween Halloween stuff is over. So I'm starting to focus on that now more. It's insane that the day after Halloween, the first things that were in my inbox were were advertisements that said, uh, "Now that Halloween is over, start planning like your Christmas decorations yep. or some stuff like that." Yeah. It's sad. It's sad. Th Halloween should be year round. <laughs> Thanksgiving is the forgotten holiday. That's for sure. You just show no. up, eat, watch football, and then roll. Nobody could forget about Thanksgiving this year because Thanksgiving is my birthday. Oh, that's the real holiday snap. we're celebrating, right? Oh snap! Right? Just no. her and a plate of mashed potatoes. That's, <laughs> that's all she needs. That's actually like the equation to making people forget about your birthday by putting it on uh, one of the biggest ho holidays of the year. But right. when I was little, it used to really piss me off when it would fall out on Thanksgiving because all you know, everyone would be out of town or with right. their families. Right. But now, as an adult. I appreciate when it falls out on Thanksgiving because that is a guarantee that I get to spend my birthday with my family. Oh, good point. Yeah. Isn't it weird That's how things good. change? Yeah, absolutely. All right, this is Mailbag. I'm going to remind you guys, we take <laughs> questions from all over the place. We take them from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Look out for the posts all over there. And then on top of that, we have mail Mailbag at... <sighs> Collider at Mailbag.com. I almost reversed it again. I almost did it. Yep. Mailbag at collider.com that's go. where you email your question we also have a podcast on the movie talk feed go check that out ready to jump into this week's question let's do it all right the first one is a twitter question from max z goof who writes what movie has the best jump scare Ooh, this is a good question i went back and forth on this one what is the one that has best jump scare and i knew i had to bring it because i was with a horror aficionado so i couldn't just go with the standard stuff although i did in the end default to the ones that i have actually seen uh and enjoyed so i will say this i know this jump scare everybody's talking about that haunted Haunting of Hill House. Don't steal my answer. Everyone's talking <laughs> about it, the jump scare. So that's not mine because I haven't seen that TV series. I don't know what's going on with that. But I will say this. My number one jump scare is The Descent. In The Descent, when you see the creatures that they have been that have been pursuing them through the movie, when you see it appear right behind the shoulder of one of the characters, you just lose your freaking mind. Especially I saw that when horror was making that turn from just the standard uh, you know, slasher film, shock, schlock type of horror, where it was becoming a little more, uh, men a little more mentally driven, a little more like in the brain, all that kind of stuff. So I really enjoyed the descent. Halloween, when Homie rolls up for and scares uh, Jamie Lee Curtis there in the first Halloween. Uh, uh, the Shining, when Jack Nicholson throws that axe into uh, uh, Scatman Crothers' chest, you you see that coming out of nowhere, and and then it goes there. And of course, I will throw it when the clown comes out of the projector when they're doing the slide in the attic when that happens I lost my eyes literally was a cat on the top of the ceiling <laughs> with my fingers dug in that was a jump scare that scared the living hell out in of the me. garage it is in, it, in the garage Sorry, the, yeah. the crazy thing about that too is that's one that was essentially spoiled in the promo campaign mm. time and time again but it still didn't make it any less effective yeah. in the actual full film I hope someone gets all my facial reactions when you're talking about like the general history of horror during the, the yeah. descent I just feel like it's a different you know <laughs> I might have had uh, some extreme reactions to that um you should watch hell house i know I'm you going should to. really watch hell I'm house so part of the reason why i chose this question mm -hmm. is because the art of the jump scare has been on my brain a lot because of the haunting of hell house on netflix if you haven't seen it yet you need to just stop everything and you need to carve out a significant amount of time because you can't just watch one episode you're going to feel the need to binge it you should binge that show but i think that that show now has one of my favorite jump scares, not just of this year, of all time in mm. it. I'm not gonna spoil when it happens, but there's something there's something that goes down in a scene with two characters and the jump scare is used in a way that it's not just a scare for the sake of scaring the viewer, it's a scare with purpose. It, it means something 
<laughs> I'm trying so hard not to spoil it, mm -hmm. but it's a moment where you're so invested in the conversation that's happening that when the jump scare happens, it scares you, but there's a reason that that scare happens to steer the story and the characters mm -hmm. in a very particular direction. So when a moment like that has value like that, that's when I think it is a jump scare used well versus let's yeah. say, oh, it's time for another scare. So boo, ah, fingers crossed, everybody jumps and screams. But right. for a movie example, I think I have to go with Paranormal Activity. Oh, especially yeah. Especially the first time I saw it, which was before, it was right before its wide release, so it was mm -hmm. before every single thing was spoiled in it, but there was something about that format where it's, you know that the sun would go down, the clock would start to spin, and you're basically just sitting there waiting for the next spooky thing to mm -hmm. happen, but the creativity behind each spooky thing mm -hmm. made each thing scarier and scarier and scarier. And the one that always got me the most and the one that I love the most is when you see the uh, the footprints oh, yeah. on the floor. Mm -hmm. I love that one. And then, of course, the ending of that movie, too, mm. is... Uh, Pretty solid jump scare there. Oof, yeah, absolutely. I love that one. And, and and it's one that makes you come... Like, all the series up until maybe the fifth or fourth one were really good. Uh, and enjoyed the hell out of me. I enjoyed the hell out of them, and they scared the hell out yeah. of me. So much so that I would go at night and close all my doors in case there was a demon that could come out and drag me into you, God knows where. Well, you do know the demon can just open the door. No. Yes. You better watch it. God damn it. <laughs> you want to take us into the next one? Yeah, yeah. Let's jump... <laughs> into the next one um let me oh uh, let me pull that one up sorry all about right that. i let, got it it's here, an instagram question yeah. from james dion 51 who writes hey guys in my best frosty wine trout voice talk a little bit about possible implications of the deadpool 2 re-release to appease chinese government censors can you see studios rationalizing a more cost-effective cut to begin with rather than having a recut and re-release thanks wow should I answer yeah, this Yeah, please first? do, since right. I should have brought it up, so go ahead. So, I mean, this has obviously been on my mind a lot because of that comment that mm -hmm. Steve made, and yeah, it's, it's a little alarming. I mean, we're constantly sitting here, especially the two of us, mm -hmm. going back and forth about business versus art and creativity, yeah. and... While I do understand the business perspective of why studios might want to jump on the bandwagon of making the first cut of their movie suitable for Chinese, uh, for the Chinese censors and the mm -hmm. Chinese government and the viewership there, it, it's definitely upsetting. So if you don't know about how this process works is they'll make a cut of the film and that's what we'll see at the domestic box office, right. but you need to submit your film to um it's the i think it's the state administration of press publication radio film and television and they need to approve it in order for it to screen in china which is obviously a major box office opportunity mm -hmm. then it's going to take some time so then you're basically sitting there waiting then they could come back and say it's not suitable for chinese uh, viewers and that means you're either dead in the water and you can't screen it there or you have to make changes mm -hmm. so the reason this comes up is because of this Deadpool 2 re-release story where some of the motivation behind that might be to deliver a film that could get approval at the Chinese box office right. and screen there. So Steve was predicting the other day that going forward in the future, rather than waste any money or time making two cuts of a movie to make sure they can screen in both places, studios might start to just make that one cut that they know is going to adhere to all these rules. Mm. So then you could see some creative restrictions, and that's very alarming to me. Yeah, I agree with you in that way. I agree with you on that part of it. I don't think there should be one cut that's palatable to Chinese viewers, therefore that's the cut that everybody gets. I'm more a fan of release the cut that's in North America, make the money that you can, then you can make adjustments to it and release it in China. Cloud Atlas did this. They cut 40 minutes out of their movie when they released it in China. I imagine they'll cut out because China is not uh, really that progressive with the LGBTQ stuff, so maybe they'll cut some of the Negasonic Teenage Warhead subplot that was going on with her lesbian relationship in Deadpool 2. Maybe they'll cut some of that out for the Chinese thing. Look, we may have ethics issues with this or moral issues with this, but this is a business. Yes, it's in the art of commerce. You want to do, you want to put out good stuff and everything like that in terms 
terms of art, but there's also money involved here. The thing with Deadpool 2 is it didn't need the China money, so it was fine. So if you make the cuts and you make it palatable to the Chinese market, great, you make a little bit of money, put it on top, you go forward. I think also there's it's a practice here that maybe PG-13 isn't so bad. Look at Venom, half a billion dollars already that it's crossed. So making a PG-13 cut of a movie is not a negative thing. This all, all these clutching of pearls about changing. It's art. Everything gets cut. You cut from R to PG. PG you put it on TV. Are you going to be mad about TV cuts too? Like all these things are just, it's all comparable. It's all like relative to the situation. I don't mind them going into China. But what, what Perry said here, if they do the original cut this way to make it palatable to mm -hmm. China before America, then I have a problem. Yeah. Absolutely. That should not be happening because the artist is allowed to have their original vision as far as they can to create the film that they want given the regulations. So not every, not every director gets final cut, but given the regulations of, a, of what they've got uh, negotiated with the studio. If the studio's going to take it and cut it to make it palatable to China, then that's a separate conversation. But if they're going to make it cut right off the bat, that's only palatable to China and release that worldwide, that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, but do you see the financial reasons why that might be in our future? Sure, but I don't think the Chinese, when the Chinese box office, I think for certain films that should be, but a majority of the box office comes from North American box office. So to me, to make changes so you can appeal to a wait, certain wait, amount. The, the majority of the box office comes from, from where did you say? I think it comes from America, from the North American, from domestic. Well, that, that's part of the problem right. is that, I, I'm not sure if it's happened at this point, but the predictions are that the Chinese box office will overtake the domestic box office. At of, of North America? Like, of, of, it, it will be more valuable. Like, the, a good example is a movie like Captain Phillips, which wasn't able to be screened in mm -hmm. China because it didn't meet the requirements. They decided that they couldn't make the changes to the movie in order right. for it to get approval. So Captain Phillips fell short of the studio expectations for this reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like, in the future, if the Chinese box office becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, which is what it looks like right yeah. now, and you eliminate that, then all of a sudden you're not hitting your financial goals. I would be very surprised if that happens. If there's anything that is uh, a trait of an American business, it is wanting to have Ameri a stronger American foothold than in the rest of the world. Do they want to make the money? Yes. But I can't imagine that they would cut. Because then you start getting films that people don't go see in North America. If you start sacrificing the North American box office because you're making cuts palatable to the Chinese box office, then you're going to stop making movies here and start making them in China. That's what's going to happen. People are going to revolt and rebel against this kind of thing. I don't think it would happen over... I don't think that would happen overall. Well, Except at, I don't think the Chinese box office is, what, 70 million but look at, look at Look at how many movies uh, already did really well and mm -hmm. basically were successes because of that number it you've warcraft recently right that but that would have been are, in big those trouble are not good films those are films that do better on the box office overseas because they're not that's what i meant is like certain i think a majority of the films uh, uh do better in north american box office than overseas because they're made for north american points of view and i mm -hmm. think that's why they make more than but other films that are action adventure films or like mindless brainless entertainment they somehow make good money overseas in other markets i mean look david hasselhoff is big in germany doesn't mean they should now start making everybody uh, german taste or the german uh, to point of view that that to me is what i think is is important here is I, don't, I don't think that uh we should lose the fact that north american box office is actually very important i think the chinese box office, if it starts to overwhelm us here Perry, I'd be very surprised that studios would take that route. I know with action adventure films, possibly, but with the more, uh, I don't know, the more intelligent Oscar fare, I couldn't see that happening. Or the bigger films like a, like a Marvel MCU stuff. Stop the presses! Jesus oh my God. Christ! Three, three. Oh my it's God! Here. It's here! Bad Boys Three! Yeah, it's Bad Boys Three! Bad Boys Three! Yep. Yep. They'll, they'll see, and that's our Josh McCuga. They're saying Bad Boys Three is going to officially announce Martin Lawrence and Will Smith says it's going to happen on Instagram. <laughs> I bet they'll cut that thing for the Chinese box that's office. That's a jump scare. That's a, that's jump, a scare. jump scare. That immediately goes oh. to number one. Perry Love. Oh my. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that, that made me a little nervous. I don't. I don't know where we left off. Anymore. Well, we just left off saying, like, I, I, I see what you're you're saying, and it, it concerns me too. I'm in the camp with you, Perry. I think it'd be scary if they started making films and cut them to be palatable for the Chinese audience, and think that's going to be the main audience for the uh, global box office. If they start undercutting North American audiences, that will cause a lot of problems. Uh, According to this IndieWire article that I just looked up in a flash, yeah. the headline is China's box office is now bigger than North America. It's time to start worrying. First quarter box office figures from China beat the U.S. and Canada for the first time. Wow. So we're here. I don't know. Yeah. I mean. <laughs>
I, but, I think it's more of an issue with a lot of the uh, the big studio films. Well, though. The, yeah, the, that's what the I mean. big studio films yeah. with the gigantic budgets that want to have mm -hmm. major worldwide appeal. Right. I understand the thinking, but you know, like I said at the very beginning, I would be very, very concerned if we started seeing only one cut of the movie to yeah. shorten and cheapen the process yeah. rather than just giving a director creative freedom right off the bat and then, you know, running your risk and having to change things after the fact and release a different cut. This is really crazy too. And I know we have to move on, but this is really crazy. If you think about Star Wars films that don't do well in China, how, what would those cuts look like? What would those changes be like? If how would that affect that franchise overall? I don't know. It's an interesting, an interesting thing that will no doubt will be something that we're going to discuss as it develops even further. Yeah, because exactly. tis here. Um, all right. Wait. Question number three is an email from Dylan Castile who writes, "Hey Collider, I was rewatching Infinity War and came across something potentially big. When Doctor Strange first meets Tony Stark and Pepper, Doctor Strange says, "Congrats on the wedding." by the way, but the wedding hasn't happened yet. I haven't seen anyone talk about this yet, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so first of all, let me just say, um, this is a film I've seen numerous times. I, I understand that moment, but to me, I didn't think it was a big deal for two reasons. A, he's Doctor Strange, which as we see later on in the film, he can explore multiple different timelines, multiple different uh, scenarios, multiple different endings. So maybe he saw Tony and uh, Pepper's wedding in the future. Certainly possible, not an issue. The other thing is this, a lot of people say that maybe he didn't think he was going to get an invite. Remember, he, he's never met Tony, or he's not a big fan. Yeah, he's never met Tony until the movie. So he's saying congrats on the wedding, by the way, assuming he might not be invited. So he's saying ahead of time, congrats on the wedding, blah, blah, blah. And then later, Tony says, Wong, you're invited to my wedding. So the wedding has not happened in the timeline of that film. It's just that maybe Doctor Strange might have seen it in the future or whatever. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think it's just a, you could even break it down to just him just being nice. Well, I mean, it. What's interesting about this question and what I've read online about it is just how, you know, speaking of international box office, people mm. in different parts of the world take these comments to mean different things. Mm. I feel like in the U.S. it can be customary to say congratulations on the wedding to a wedding that hasn't even happened yet. Right. So I just found that, you know, how people read that comment differently. Mm. It's just interesting to consider things like that. But there is also the possibility that you brought up that, mm. I mean, Doctor Strange can see into the future. He yeah. can see that maybe they were married already. And then we also had those comments from Gwyneth Paltrow about their their situation and the possibility of them having a kid. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, no, none of that obviously happened by the end of Infinity War. But depending on how you read her comments and read into every little word she said mm -hmm. and, and the use of comments, mm -hmm. it could mean that that is something that is likely to come in Avengers 4. I know a lot of that sparked thoughts about maybe there being a big time jump between yeah. Infinity War and Avengers 4, which who knows, maybe it could happen, maybe yeah. it couldn't, but I don't know, her comments were always very specific in that with right. this topic, so I do see a future where they're married with a kid. Well, that means Tony survives. And we don't know what's going to happen in Avengers 4. Is that a tease that Tony might survive Avengers 4? Obviously, everybody feels Tony is the key to this thing since Iron Man started this whole MCU thing when Doctor Strange says to him, you're the, you're the one that's got to do it here. So we'll see if that means Tony survives this whole thing, ends up marrying Pepper and retires. Yeah, yeah. just uh, for the record, her comments were Pepper and Tony have had a really long journey together. She obviously starts as his dutiful assistant, and then the relationship evolves. And now this decade later, they're married and they have a child. Mm. Their relationship has evolved in all of the ways that great romances evolve. It's interesting. Hashtag pepperoni. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to number four. Is that four, a yeah. thing? Yeah, that's what that's you put really, on, on That's really Instagram, funny. Uh, right. Pepperoni, O-N-Y. <laughs> uh, email number four here. This comes from email on a question number four. Sean Nguyen, he writes, Hello, Collider team. I have recently been using my streaming subscriptions to catch up on, on some movies that I missed over the years for one reason or another. The There are movies that I always wanted to see but missed them at the time and never went back to them. They're not necessarily all-time classics, but ones I wanted to see or, hear, or heard <laughs> good things about. Some of my recent ones include Smokey and the Bandit, Phenomenon, IP, Ip Man, rather, and Buckaroo Banzai. Uh, what are some quote-unquote average movies, not movies that make everyone's top 100, that you missed that you plan to eventually circle back around to? So I use this as an excuse to write out my list of movies that I've missed this year that I still <laughs> need to see. Okay. And on that list right now, and I'm talking about average movies specifically, uh -huh. ones that aren't like, oh, I need to see it because it has Oscar consideration, just right. because I missed it and I want to see it. Mamma Mia, here we go again. Oh my God, I didn't why? see that. Well, why? The why first Perry? one isn't that great, but it's fun. And if I can just have 
two hours at the theater where I'm smiling and listening to music and seeing a sweet romance. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. The Equalizer 2. And funny thing was, The Equalizer used to be on this list for a good while, and I caught that really late. And when I watched it, I'm like, wow, that was awesome. Why did I miss it? Yeah. Uh, I want to see Smallfoot. Okay. I also really want to see Book Club. The fact that I haven't seen Book Club yet actually really bothers me because it was such a big hit. I also haven't seen A Simple Favor yet. I really okay. need to circle back for that. Mm -hmm. Den of Thieves, Peppermint, Winchester, Proud Mary, and Revenge. Wow. Those are Those are on my list for 2018. Okay. All right. I will throw some in here because I always have a stack of movies in my Netflix queue that are ones you that do. I gotta get around to. Yeah, the founder is certainly one I never you saw. You haven't seen the founder. Yeah, the Michael Keaton one. You I would really, really like the founder. Yeah, I, 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 I think really, so. really wanted to see that one. Uh, the Wave is the other big one that everyone keeps talking I about. Love that the foreign wave. one that everyone like was a big yeah. big fan of. Uh, that's another one that I definitely want to get uh, uh, under my list here. The Little Prince. A lot of people talked yeah. about that as an animated film that was uh, enjoyable from so many people. Um, and I will say, there's another one here. Where, where, oh, the sequel to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I have yet to watch that, hmm. and I love that damn movie and champion it so much. So there's a lot of them. Beasts of No Nation I haven't seen yet, oh, which wow. a lot of people talked about. Um, and I Oof. think that's those are. I mean, that I just have so keep many. Keep you busy for a really long time. Yeah, and it does. It, it really does. There's so many here, but I will throw other ones in there that I haven't seen. I never saw The African Queen. I know a lot of people consider that to be a really good film. Uh, I, I haven't seen a, a, a number of films that uh, Brando did, like Missouri Breaks, One Eye mm. Jacks. Those are another ones that uh, that aren't necessarily the big big popular ones, but I never got around to seeing that one as well. So there, there's there's so many, and pretty much the entire oeuvre of Betty Davis. I've never seen All About Eve. I've never seen... I've never seen All About Eve? Yeah, never that really surprises those, me. Some of those classics, some of those uh, Betty Davis classics I haven't got around to yet. What happened? To, whatever happened to Rosemary's Baby? I've never seen that. So there's a lot. As much as I've seen, and being a Schmodown champion, mm -hmm. uh, there's still so many more that I still need to see. That's the pleasure and the joy of movies. I'll throw in one more category of movies that I tend to miss that mm -hmm. are just mind-blowing to me you know when you go on a set visit no. and you get like super excited about that movie because you get to see little bits of it before anybody else and you almost like feel involved and i mm -hmm. i normally when i first started out doing this i would go on a set visit and i would be so pumped to see the movie just because you see it being made and you want to see how it turned out right two of them that i had a last on those set visits and never got around to seeing the movies were Monster Trucks, <laughs> which is still one of my favorite set visits I've ever been on because sure. oftentimes when you go on these, they're for big movies, like big Marvel movies or something. Mm -hmm. And they just come with so much pressure to know everything when you're there on set and to ask like almost like probing questions to figure out where it's all heading. Yeah. Whereas Monster Trucks was a, co a completely original IP and we went in knowing absolutely nothing. It was just really refreshing to approach mm -hmm. something that way. And I never saw the movie. Um, and the other one is The Last Witch Hunter. I was on the the, <laughs> the Pittsburgh set wow. of Last Witch Hunter. We were in like like tunnels, mines the entire time. And yeah. it was so much fun. Vin Diesel was the happiest guy <laughs> in the world on that set. And I was really looking forward to it. And then I never saw it. There you go. So I'll circle back for those <laughs> right. soon. All right. We got one more question we to hit do. today. It is a Twitter question from Textural Tentacle. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tentacle. Who writes... Firstly, a big warm hello from the UK. Secondly, in Inside Out, key moments that make up Riley's life are represented by core memories. So my question is, what are some of your core memories that represent key moments in your life? Keep up the good work. I love this. this, this I love is, this because it, it reflects the the inside out effect, mm -hmm. which is why I think that movie is so beautiful and touching. And it's still one of my favorite Pixar movies ever. It's yeah. just the idea of challenging you to reflect, you know, yeah. on your emotions, your memories, your personality islands. I love it. <laughs> Um, damn, this is a really tough thing when you break down all the islands that were there, right? The shit, Hockey Island, Family Island, Friendship Island, Goofball Island, of course, her other one that was uh, Personality Islands. But like for me, so I would say three, I guess, core memories will always be a part of me. And that is in 1979 when I played baseball for the first time. First time ever playing organized baseball. We ended up winning a championship that year, and I never played baseball again. And that just put that in thing, that sports thing inside of me that still carries through today when I do the Shmoda on this need to be a champion, need to win. It's a competitive thing inside me. It's always been there since I was 
was a, a little child. Uh, I'd say the other memory is the last conversation I had with my father. That's a core memory for me because it really changed my life from this kind of uh, goofy kid who was kind of like figuring out what was I going to do with my life, acting, not acting, what's my commitment, what if I fail, whatever. All of that kind of changed the, after I had this final conversation with my father before he passed, like four days before he passed, kind of gave me this like a different way, to, a different perspective to look at the world, look at life, and I've kind of carried that forward. And I would also say the first time I ever fell in love uh, with uh, my girlfriend from Virginia, Toy Ray, we went to see Aladdin. We had this uh, incredible moment uh, between us watching the movie, and we ended up like spending the rest of the, of the night together, and there was just a great, like just great uh, feeling of love and possibilities. And that's the first time I ever felt that in my heart for a woman. So to me, that was, that's one of those, those core memories uh, that are really powerful still. And I even use that line, like, do you trust me when we hung out that <laughs> night? So it was just a really great, yeah, did. of course I did, cheesy <laughs> as hell. But like, it was just, it's just those kind of things that they, that construct who I am uh, as a person. So. That's so sweet. Yeah, well, Thank you for sharing thank that. Thank you, core <laughs> memories. You know? um, there are so many memories that make up who I am. So I, I use the person, cause it's like the, the core memory powers the personality island. So uh -huh. I kind of backtracked that way. So I have a movie island. Okay. And what got that one up and running was my first screening of Jurassic Park. I've told the story time yep. and time again of going with my family, but it's like in that specific moment, specifically when the T-Rex breaks out of its paddock, it's like something lit up. Mm -hmm. And then that movie island formed. <laughs> um, my career islands, because yeah. I'm very career driven, I'm very ambitious. I think that that one really got going during my first internship in high school. Mm -hmm. So in, in high school, I was in this weird English program where it was like, uh, th it was the last three periods of the day and you would have a college like setting where you would oh. take Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, uh, Friday classes and Wednesday was like a community building day. Right. Anyway, when you're a senior, you're allowed to cut out two of those days and go do an internship to start, you know, preparing for college and for life. And right. I worked at a radio station on Long Island called KJOY. Okay. And it was really one of my first job opportunities in the media realm. And, you know, I was doing stupid stuff like washing their vans and filling them up with gas. And <laughs> I had to wear like the, the damn mascot costume once, but just watching all those people and being like, I'm going to do that and I'm going to do better. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I really wanted to. Respect. Where, where am I now? Oh, uh, fa family island. Of course, I have a family island and it's made up of like a bajillion different wonderful sure. memories. But like the one visual I always get in my head is when for my grandparents 50th anniversary, it was the one time everyone traveled together and we all went to Longboat Key in Florida. Mm -hmm. And it's I think it's the last time all of us ever travel together because yeah. normally you know now cousins have kids and all that stuff and we all have jobs so it's difficult but yeah. that's my favorite family visual and then obviously i have a dewey island <laughs> and i'll never forget picking up dewey and picking him out for the first time because also nana was there oh, yeah. and when nana's there for something like that it becomes extra special and i just have this like picture of nana and baby dewey like having their first moment and that was a sign <laughs> to me that 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 was my cat and first sure time. enough now i have dewey island up and running <laughs> to the fullest extent that's it i think that's, oh, a, that's, that's a great way to end it very sweet my heart memories. is full yeah. so now mailbag can end <laughs> thank you guys so much for sending in these great questions as always roca thank you for being here with me thank today you. don't forget to like and share this episode of collider mailbag and also tune in tomorrow we got another one mark riley will be joining me so thanks for watching see you soon hey everybody mark ellis here thanks for watching this episode you want to watch more then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from collider if you haven't subscribed to collider video do so right now and share this vid with your friends thanks for watching